we're talking about is money and sex. When you take the soul and you put it in a body and you subject it to the risks of this world, all of a sudden, there's the possibility for moral failure. See, our experiences will be useful to other people. If it can't, if it does not run the risk of becoming the very thing that is poison, then it can't be used for the mitzvah, which celebrates humility either. Welcome to the In Search of More podcast. I am your host, Ellie Nash. Join me weekly on my quest for more, more from myself and more from this world. We'll see you on the other side. All right. Reb Chase, we're back. We're back. We're back. It still feels fresh to me. Don't worry. I want, I want to let you know that each time we talk, it still feels fresh. I still appreciate it. The gift I'm that keeps getting, on giving. Right. I'm not taking uh, you or this for granted. Our conversations are, um, are valued and appreciated. Each one if it was, as if it was the only one that ever happened or will happen. I'm still, I'm still starstruck by the fact that I get to speek to someone who wrote a book that helped me so much. God of understanding. <laughs> That's uh, very humbling. Okay. What can I say? Okay. Uh, all right. So today uh, we had an interesting discussion yesterday, which the themes that we talk about come come across come about very naturally. You and I. There's nothing. Yeah, we're having conversations. Some thought comes up. It's not like we went so, and we found out what terms are people searching on Google. Oh, let's go talk about that. Well, that's what we did here, but that's what we were naturally talking about. <laughs> so this actually, that's not the perfect analogy because we kind of did, but that's what we were oh, discussing. Oh, we did? I think it was within your email, right? Oh, 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 but it was <laughs> it wasn't intentional. It's the, no, Google it copy, intentional. Copy, is copying us, and we'll explain it. This is getting confusing. Go ahead. Okay. How did it so, organically emerge that we're going to talk about what we're talking about, which we didn't even explain yet what we're going to be talking about? Right. What we're talking about is money and sex. Okay. Clickbait. Right. Clickbait. So you had shared with me that there were a number of conversations that you had over the last few weeks. And, right, you have uh, what is it, an open rate, right? You send this X email to, say, 10,000 people. And let's say on average, 3,000 people click and 1,500 people watch. Whatever the number, right? Whatever the numbers are, right? And there were two that stuck out as um, above and beyond the norm. I was looking at my email uh, analytics, and uh, there were two that stuck out. Well, there, there, well, there was one that first stuck out, which got a lot of opens, and that was the one where you and I spoke about money. Remember that conversation? We Correct. spoke about money, money and faith. Yes. Yeah. So that, um, I don't remember the open rate. I mean, usually I get about a 50% open rate. And so this had like even more, but what was really, really high was the, with the click through rate where people actually click. And that was like three times higher than the average. So you have the email, it comes in the subject, right? Someone goes and then if they see the subject, they go and open the email. That's one thing. And, and then, then if they, they actually the email, click, they click to, to go, go to watch the video. the video, that's a whole other level, yeah. Right. All yeah. of this is being measured, and uh, sure. being that we're in the 21st century, yes. and a rabbi is looking to share his message with the world. These are the tools we he use. He looks at such things, right? He, he, he looks at such things as um, click-through rates. So I, I, I pointed out to my social media manager that this uh, email did very, very well, and and... Then I also said, by the way, did you see what the other email that we sent recently also did disproportionately well? And what was it? It was um, a class that I gave about marriage and intimacy for women. What was the name of the class, name of the email? Just, it was like that, marriage and intimacy? The, the marriage and intimacy, yeah. Yeah, something like that. And that just, also just, had a higher than normal open rate, but a really high, like two or maybe three times the norm as far as click, click rate. Okay. While we're speaking, this is very natural. I'm going to call Tyler to help me with something. Tyler, can you help me out over here? I cannot see the rabbi. So Tyler is, uh, 
the fine gentleman. I can't see the rabbi on the, the screen. Tyler is the fine gentleman that uh, assists us on the uh, with the podcast, disseminating the message. The, in our previous conversation on the sicha we learned together, we spoke about uh, the next hire you need to do. You need a, a Tyler in New York, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Did we speak about? I don't think we spoke about it in the podcast. I think we spoke about it after the podcast. It's on maybe. the sicha, on the sicha. Yeah, it wasn't the sicha on money. But even while it was recorded, did we speak about it while it was being recorded, or maybe I think it was afterwards? No, we did. We, we did. did. We spoke about the the chauffeur, the chauffeur, and having a driver <laughs> and the discomfort and you know, those things. Yeah, using yeah. your talents for things like click through. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, we, I spoke about it in right. a general term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I don't know how explicitly we got into it. So these two emails had a really high click-through rate. And so I was pointing it out. I mean, not that I would do this purposely um, and like play into it in a manipulative way, but I was observing, hmm, you see, what are the two things that people click on disproportionately more than other subjects? And obviously, everything we send out is relevant, or we hope it's relevant. We're not spamming people. We're, right. we're sending out content that people signed up for that we think they'll like. But these two subjects, money and intimacy, that's, that's just like through the roof, like nothing right. else. All right. So you shared that with me. And what yeah. I responded was that my, my theories on both of them is that they, they serve as excellent personal development sandboxes mm -hmm. the areas that hit the deepest parts of us and force us to work ourselves out in the deepest way so like the connection made a lot of sense to me the fact that they were uh that they were both there and what okay. responded to me yeah oh okay came, so you yeah you're right. remind remind me of the conversation right so what you responded to me is that it's interesting that the Animal soul, the Nefesh Bahamas, is seeking out the same things. For those who haven't studied Chassidus, how should we uh, translate the... I mean, you translated it into English, and, and Nefesh Bahamas says animal soul, but th th that's a literal translation. How, what's a functional translation? Uh, the functional translation is, you know, our ego and our higher self, maybe, right? The ego and our higher self are both drawn to sex and money in some way, is what you said. But the, are those two different things, different ego reasons. and higher self? The ego, the selfish part of ourself, the selfless part of ourselves. Okay, so the ego is the lower self, the base self, and then yes. the higher self is the higher self. Our soul. Our, the soul. Our higher okay. self, our soul. Our, uh huh. Uh huh. The best version of ourselves, right? That we're both drawn. Uh -huh. So you were saying that you know okay. it catches the eyes of our, it catches the attention of our basest, most coarse instincts money and intimacy. well well let me just interject and say by definition clicking is not a big cerebral thing clicking is like an automatic almost an automatic thing so right. yeah clicking is a good measure of what you react to on a, on a gut level um it's not like there's a whole lot of deep thought that goes into it so it's it, Clicking is a really good indication of where your um, base instincts are drawn. Correct. And the thought you shared, which is very interesting, is that the godly instinct is also drawn to that in some way for perhaps the same reason that I was mentioning, that they're excellent personal development right. sandboxes. Right, right. So interestingly enough, <laughs> the lower self what we're calling the base instinct or maybe you'll call the survival mechanism or uh, the body's desire for self-preservation, um, that lower self, or we call it the animal soul, is very interested in those two topics for reasons that I think are probably obvious, or at least on the superficial level for reasons that I think are right. obvious. But the the... The unexpected twist is that the godly soul is also interested in those subjects for the right. reason that you mentioned, that because those are the two, you call them sandboxes, I might call them uh, uh, laboratories, <laughs> yeah. w in which to work out the, 
the purpose for which we came to this world. Nothing will, nothing will force personal growth like, like those, two areas. those two. Yeah, those two issues. Right. Money and intimacy. Money and sex. Yeah. Right. I, you know, what, what came to mind when we were talking is I had a, um, a sponsee who was doing really, really well in recovery. First, he was, you know, recovery from uh, sexual addiction, porn addiction, these kind of behaviors. And it was touch and go for a while where his addiction got so bad that there was a, a giving up quality to it, right? Suicidal ideation or suicidal, um, definitely thoughts were, were consuming him. And fast forward a couple of years and he was doing well. He was doing really well. Sober and clear and helping others in recovery and everything else. And during this process, he um, moved out of all relationships. He was single when he started, but a somewhat of a serial dater. And through the course of recovery, he said, no dating, I'm not ready, and everything else. Mm -hmm. One day he shares with me um, that he met a, a woman, he's interested in her, and he's thinking about maybe pursuing it, and he asked me what I thought about it. So, you know, back and forth, what do you think about it? Asked him. So he said, well, I'm concerned about, you know, my recovery and navigating these things. And I said, mm -hmm. listen, to stay sober in a rehab center is not such a, uh, mm -hmm. is, is not such a feat. It's great. And it's important, an important step in the process. But we didn't get sober to stay sober in meetings. It's, a, it's hard to do at the beginning, but it's not, the, it's, it's, it's not the goal. Once we get there, the idea is to take certain risks. To practice these principles in all of our affairs, like the 12th <laughs> step says. Affairs. Right. To actually have right. a life within which to practice your recovery yeah right a fear is in a, a sexual addiction program has a different connotation i'm kidding, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> anyway but yes and uh fast forward a couple of months and he was derailed completely derailed he started dating her and all of these like all the things came back and his his first thought process was everything was doing good until this girl came into my life and she screwed me up and I said, no, <laughs> blame it on the girl <laughs> Right, it's not what happened at all. What happened is, is my recovery we was just fine until. <laughs> right. Yeah. We were sober in this context because that was one area that we needed to learn how to be, have our head straight. And now we stepped into another situation. And some of the things that previously had not been triggered, maybe even necessary, they were just not there. They weren't, they weren't necessary to work out in order to stay sober in recovery now became necessary to work out in their relationship. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would imagine that parenting adds a third level of, uh, of this as well, but we're keeping this conversation to, uh, to, to sex and money. How do you think you get kids? <laughs> and how do you think you actually raise, raise them? them? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so th that's the sum total of those two subjects. <laughs> Right, not a bad, uh, uh, but you know the the now seeing him a few years later into this process, and the different person he's become by having to learn how to stay sober in the context of a relationship. It's just a completely different person, and I'm thinking like, had that guy stayed in recovery for the next three years, and yeah, I'm sure there would have been some growth. It would not have been the same. The way the relationship tested him. And what the f places it forced him to go was on a completely, mm -hmm. completely so you're saying um, it was it, it, it knocked him out of his game, but then in the end, it was like we say, Yurida, let's say to Halia, yeah, 100%. Like Descent who he is today for the sake of a subsequent greater life, yes, yeah, in all aspects of his life. Mm -hmm. If we think about let's just talk about it from the 12th, from the 12th step, not the 12th steps, the 12th step of the service, he is much more. What do we say? Our experiences will be useful to other people. We see how our experiences become useful to other people. Right. He is seeing much more clearly how his experiences can be useful to more people in more ways now than then. Like he's become more of a uh, mm -hmm. more more of an individual. One example, one example over there. But I can share personal ones as well. But it was one that like immediately came to mind as as we we're talking like this. We wouldn't be the same person with or without relationships. But you're saying as much as it's a catalyst for growth, at least the story that you used to uh, illustrate the point, um, 
although it's a catalyst for spiritual growth, it's not necessarily or perhaps necessarily not linear growth. Meaning there's, no, all, there's a lot of risk and needs. therefore there's a lot of uh, loss and setbacks and... Yes, I mean, is that is that sort of us. like part and parcel of working in these areas that you're sort of signing up for that? Uh, what do you call it? The two steps forward, one step, what, two steps forward, one step back, or maybe one, one step, step back. back, two steps forward. <laughs> <laughs> right. There's all right. It's one step back, two steps forward. Exactly. That's chova, by the way. That what's step. what's chova? Right. Chova is one step back, two steps forward. Oh wow, that's such a nicer way of saying it. One step back, two steps forward. Two <laughs> <laughs> steps forward, one step back. Uh, right. <laughs> okay, good. Because, right, it's you read the Tarah Chaliyah. Okay. That's the difference between... But, but I'm asking a question. Are, uh, you're telling people these areas are going to force you to work and they're going to inspire uh, growth. But I think it's fair to make a disclaimer, sort of, that what you're tacitly encouraging people to do, or maybe you're you're explicitly telling them to do this but i think you need to <laughs> inform them of the risk involved not, not not only risk it's almost like an inevitability there will be setbacks correct that's well, how, the nature yeah. of it because that's how we move forward uh -huh. it's like you get slapped in the head and you say what is this uh well, can can wait, I share with a fresh person yeah. example actually go ahead go ahead uh, uh, well, I'll, like I'll, I'll I'll tell you what this make me think of right now don't get bored here, but uh, and I'm not speaking yeah. to you, Ellie, because I know you find everything I say fascinating, but I'm speaking to our <laughs> audience. Don't get bored here. I'm going to say something very rabbinic, and it's going to sound uh, technical, but okay. You know the holiday of Passover? I'm familiar with it. So. Okay. And you know how we clean and clean and clean to get rid of all the chomets, the leaven product in our homes? Correct. And you don't even want to have a crumb of it around. You want to get rid of all of it. Okay. Fine. Um, and then what do we do once Passover starts? We bring in boxes and boxes and boxes, like entire pallets <laughs> of a Correct. food item. Correct. It's essentially, it's bread, right? It's called matzah. But what's the difference between matzah and bread, meaning the stuff that we just thoroughly <laughs> got rid of. The only difference is it's the same exact ingredients. It's flour and it's water. Okay. It's flour and water. The only difference is that the matzah was baked in less than 18 minutes. That from the time the water touched the flour till the time the baking was finished was less than 18 minutes. Correct. Okay. So that seems like a little bit risky to me. If you just get rid of all the leavened product in your home, why would you bring something into your home that is only minutes away in its creation from having become the very thing that you just got rid of? In other words, just hear me out. Just eat, eat fruit for the week. Just eat fruit and vegetables. Why, why, why do a play? Juice cleanse. Why, yeah, why, do a juice cleanse. Why play with fire? Why are you playing around bringing in the thing that you just got rid of? You told me that this chametz is poison during the eight days of Passover. Okay, great. So why are you playing around with something that's it's like if, if I told you, right. did you mix these two chemicals in a cup, uh, they turn into deadly poison within 18 minutes. So just drink it quicker. It's like, I don't, I don't need... Now, I, I want to make sure everyone understands. I'm not saying that matzah itself can become chametz still. It, it, once matzah is matzah, it's not going to become chametz. But what I'm asking you is, you have so much faith in the people at the bakery? <laughs> I understand there's a kosher supervision, and that's why they have a, you know, a symbol on it, that they, they supervised it, but humans are humans. Like you're, you're basically asking a human being to supervise and make sure that these two ingredients, flour and water, which create chametz, that they watched it and made sure that that didn't happen. Like, instead of relying on all that, just don't bring it in your home. Okay, so you're going to tell me, but hold on. There's a mitzvah to eat matzah 
at the Seder. On the anniversary of our exodus from Egypt, we have a special mitzvah. Um, it's one of the props, actually. It's literally a prop. <laughs> we, in the Seder, we say matzah zoo. This matzah, we're supposed to actually pick it up or touch it. And this matzah, and, and, and we say that when our forefathers left Egypt, they didn't even have time for their bread to rise, and they ate something just like this, and we're supposed to actually use the matzah as a prop. Okay, so we have to have matzah, so we can't avoid it. We're going we're to have to have this uh, flour and water mixture. Okay, so I have another idea for you. There are other things that you can make bread out of. It doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be flour, I mean, meaning it doesn't have to be wheat flour. You could use something else. Okay, you're going to say, I can't use rice flour because oh, if you're Ashkenazi, you can't use the rice. If you're Sephardic, you can use the rice. But let's say, let's say um, potato flour, potato flour. Okay, and by the way, if you go to the Pesach hotels, they make all types of stuff out of potato flour. They make hot dog buns out of potato flour. So let's make matzah out of potato flour and avoid the entire risk. Or you can say, if it's worth taking the risk, it's just for the Seder. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That You could say that as well. Like, you'll take the, the risk. Pesach, stay away from it. Eat the bare the minimum. Right? Okay. So this question is actually asked. I didn't think of it. Um, the Jerusalem Talmud asks the question, and the Jerusalem Talmud answers the question. It says, the Torah tells us we can't do this, because it says in the Torah, and guard the matzah. Guard the matzah. Guard means it has to be something that if not for vigilant intervention, meaning guarding, would oh, have okay. become the very thing that is the problem. Okay, I see where you're going. Okay, so Chassidus comes and explains this in a really powerful way that's applicable to each of us in our personal lives. and says like this. Chometz, the puffiness of it, represents the inflated ego. Matzah, the flatness of it, represents humility. Where is the soul humble? Up in heaven. Because up in heaven, it sees the truth. It sees that God is everything. That's it. It doesn't get any big ideas up, up in heaven. But that's not matzah. That's flat because it's just they didn't mix the flour and the water. Nothing, that nothing could become. Or maybe you call it, maybe it's potato bread. <laughs> it's potato bread. It can't. Potato, potato starch, you mix it with water. It can't leaven. It doesn't leaven. Okay. But when you take the soul and you put it in a body and you subject it to the risks of this world, all of a sudden, there's the possibility for moral failure. But now there's also part and parcel of that, inherent with that, is the possibility for moral failure victory and for growth. So therefore, if it, if it can't become chametz, it can't be matzah either. If it can't, if it does not run the risk of becoming the very thing that is poison, then it can't be used for the mitzvah, which celebrates humility either. If it can't become chametz, it can't be matzah. The very same ingredients, the same grains that you use that would become chametz, those are the same grains that you use to make matzah. And if you try to play it safe and use a different type of grain that doesn't leaven, then that won't be acceptable matzah either. So if you try to play it safe and, and avoid embodiment, let's say. Right, let's say you had a say in the for. matter. Hmm? This isn't what we're looking for. Well... <sighs> I don't know if it's we're not what, looking for a no. A, we're not looking for a no chametz experience where there's a no risk of chametz. Well, we're, we, we, right. We're not looking. Well, I don't know if it's what we're looking for. I'm talking about what God's looking for, because maybe if you would ask me, I would say, let's not run the risk. Like leave my soul in heaven, and and play it safe. But God, God is not okay with that. Right, that means the instruction for us now. And obviously there are levels of that within this world here. There's levels, of, for example, 
take the, the Rebbe's philosophy, being Hasidic in Crown Heights, surrounded by it, where there's not the Crown Heights of today, but <laughs> at the time, the shtetl, <laughs> there was a time where it was completely separated and there was much less risk of encountering things that would um, turn us sideways. And the Rebbe's philosophy was, no, go out to those places, take that risk. Well, it's, it's very interesting you say that as, as a Crown Heights boy, because I'm going to ask you a question. Did the Rebbe say you should go out on shlichus, meaning you should go be a, what the Rebbe called a member of the spiritual uh, uh, spiritual Peace Corps? When Kennedy came out with the Peace Corps, so the Rebbe had a whole talk about, mm -hmm. I'm making a Peace Corps as well. So question to you as a Crown Heitzer. So do you think that the Rebbe said that people should join what he called the spiritual Peace Corps and go out and help others? Um, and that the reason that that is justified, it's relieving the, 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 the safety of the, what you call the shtetl. Is that justified because of the help that you're going to be providing others? Or is it justified furthermore by the unique growth experiences that you yourself are going to have by going out and helping others? So I literally recorded an episode today, which will probably titled something like, We Are Patient Zero. Like the only reason we're ever doing anything is for ourselves. Mm. And I share any sense is that at the end of the day, you know, and actually when I was sharing it, the, an example I gave for it was a discussion we had last week. You I and I had. I, you and I had. We had a discussion where we learned to Sikha together. So I said, who do you think learned to Sikha better? Me or the audience? Mm. And let's say it differently. Because of the format that was done, that was provided, which was us preparing it separately and then us having a discussion live, who benefited from that format the most? Me. I learned it in a different way. You and I had a conversation in a different way. I was right. focused in a different way. Who learns more, the teacher or the student? Who benefits? Oh, no question. More, you know? No question. Yeah, it's a teacher. So I think it's the same... What's funny is that as I was talking about it, I was planning to use um, Chabad, the whole Chabad con concept as an example. Okay. That it's, it's really about the shluchim. It's not really so much about yeah. the, uh, the community. It's really about the, MS, the, the members of the Spiritual Peace Corps. Those, you who, are, you mentioned those your, are who are benefiting from it. Your that. first story was about a sponsee. Correct. Which, which means you, know, you sponsor people in 12-step recovery. So... According to the program, what's the purpose of sponsorship? Who benefits? We keep what we have. We keep what we have by giving it away. Right. And the truth is, you know how you know, you know, how you know that uh, the sponsor gets more from it than the sponsee? Mm. Is that the sponsee doesn't have enough, so he has to go out and sponsor someone else. He doesn't get enough from the relationship, so he has to do something oh. else. Oh, wow. The sponsor doesn't. You know, wow, that that's boom. Because I, you know, the Rebbe said that influencing somebody, teaching them, is like in a in a way giving birth to them. Uh, we're told if you teach your friend's son Torah, it becomes like you fathered that that child, even though right. he's not your biological yeah, child. So the Rebbe says teaching Torah family, is. Right? Is pruravu is be fruitful and multiply in the spiritual sense. So then the Rebbe says that, um, but many people don't know this, but the mitzvah of being fruitful and multiplying is actually two generations. It's to, yeah, it's not just to have children, it's to have children who have children. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So <laughs> the Rebbe says, <laughs> when have you done the mitzvah? When have you influenced somebody? You know, when your sponsee has becomes a sponsor. Oh, right. When your sponsee yeah, has sponsees, right? So I always thought about it as an obligation. Like if you learn something, somebody taught you, so it's sort of like an obligation to go carry it forward. But you're pointing out another aspect of it, which is forget about that for a minute. Just focus on the effect that it has on the recipient. 
it's not enough for the recipient to be a recipient. Correct. A sponsee is not going to stay sober just by having a great sponsor. They're going to need to have their own sponsees or sponsee, or it's not going to be good enough for them. Enough from the relationship. Yeah, so it's not, not just, it's not just it's not just an obligation, a moral imperative, the right thing to do, which it is. It is all that. But you're saying it's actually it's it's a practical necessity. You can't Correct. avoid it for long. Right, hundred percent. One thousand. I can give a. Um, you wanted to say something, but I. Can no, give, no. Go ahead. Uh, I was thinking of a personal example in my own life where, um, this sandbox or laboratory of intimacy allowed for a realization that it, it was something about me that existed in me previously. I just didn't. I never identified it in this way. And it's a recent one, so it's kind of fresh. So my wife and I had a little bit of a um, disagreement, discussion around, um, specifically I had said, hey, when you go out, like don't stay out too late because it affects me the next day. Because I don't end up falling asleep until she's back and everything else. So she says, are you sure that you just don't like when I go out? Maybe tell you don't like when I go out. And that's what this is. So I reacted very strongly to it, right? Like, you know, and when I did, I used like, what are you dismissing my concerns for? Or something of that nature. Like, what are you dismissing my concerns? So when I had a sponsor who once uh, communicated to me, he said, if it's hysterical, it's historical, right? So it was a disproportion, what that means, if my response is disproportionate to the, to what is going on right. in the room, then most likely it activated something historically inside me. Right. You're not that worked up about what's going on now. Now, exactly. Exactly. Right. So if, if someone was observing this interaction from the outside, they would have been left with the question of how did it escalate there that fast? Right. And it wasn't a major, it wasn't a major blow up. It just it took the conversation from here to there. Hey, this is what I'm this is my request. Are you sure it's not this? No, it's absolutely not. Don't dismiss my concerns. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I could have met it with the same tone and it would have been appropriate. But, yeah. you know, enough of this kind of, kind of like, okay, now I'm back in, in my own sandbox. That happened. And what was this really about? And the recognition that I had last night and this morning, I was fresh, was that this is a feeling that I felt before, a sense of, um, being dismissed in some way. Mm. And that feeling is an old feeling that lives inside me. And fortunately, my wife was gracious enough to uh, point it out to me. <laughs> All right, this thing and the benefits that I'll receive once I work through this, which will take some digging and, you know, maybe some, some discomfort, but the benefits I get once I work through this age old feeling of being dismissed is one that will have much more benefits than not than just not reacting strongly in conversations with my wife. It's definitely affecting other areas of, of me. My ego is more prominent in the world because of this belief, because of these interactions that I've never, I've never known, I've never used those words. There was the, the moment was a pressure I created a pressure and like almost a, there was like a pressure cooker in that moment. And what emerged from it was this realization that a feeling of dismissal is one that's familiar to me. Mm -hmm. And now, right from that emerged a new piece of information, but it's not a new reality. It's just a new piece of information. So you're saying this and is the ego. This is yeah. the crumb that you mentioned earlier, right? We're sweeping the house of the crumbs. This is much more than a crumb, mind you. But I didn't know. I didn't know of it, right? We needed the feather. We needed the spoon. We needed the <laughs> the candle. We need. We needed, right? So really, we needed the candle. Okay. Now it's my job to take the feather and the spoon. But the candle has been lit. This dismissal is much more than, than uh, than her. It's me. Me feeling a sense of dismissal, and that's the sandbox that it allows for. But the, here's the, what I, here's what I want to ask you. You're saying this is an issue. 
this is your issue. You're owning it. And you're saying it shows up in a lot of areas in life. So I'm going to ask you, since it shows up in so many areas of life, how come you didn't work it out in one of those areas? How come you gained unique insight into this issue, which is a ubiquitous issue. You're telling me that's ubiquitous, ubiquitous, ubiquitous. It shows up in your life in all sorts of uh, areas. It's a sort of a constant thing. So why are you telling me that it was your marriage where you worked it out? Right. So it, it doesn't show up everywhere. Knowing what I know, I know it is everywhere, but it doesn't show its head everywhere. Oh. Oh, uh-huh. in other words, I mean, if I gave you an example of that, yeah, it was through my work, um, healing porn addiction, which is another, right. The whole realm of sexuality, healing my dependency on, on pornography. I noticed that I carry with me a feeling of being of, of carried since childhood. Like when I was sexually abused, the abuse didn't leave anything with me. It was. It happened and now I'm gone. It, meaning it didn't, there's nothing physical that shows up on me. What did, what, in what way did it affect me? So two of the most prominent beliefs that I took on from those experience were one, I am weak because he physically overpowered me. And in my eight year old mind, didn't occur to me that he's six years older and he should, I'm still weak. I was weak then and I'm weak now. And the other was, it was a certain disgust, like a stain on my soul, so to speak, that I, that I took with me. It took working through it in that way to notice that this belief was deep inside me. I am weak, I am disgusting. Those two beliefs lived inside me. When I worked through it, I realized that in every relationship, in every area of my life, this was playing a role. These beliefs were affecting the way I related to everyone, the way I operated when I worked, the way I operated and in com- in communicating with others, the way I showed up, would I show up on a camera if I still had the, the beliefs of I am disgusting and I am weak? Of course not. I had to work through those. But what, what, what was the candle that lit this dark spot of my uh, reality open was the work that I had to do on sex action. So the same is true with this. I'd never use the words dismissed with this tone. I'd never use it in this way. But now that I recognize that, hey, this is something that I'm sensitive to. Why? Because, you know, for whatever reason, I felt this way at an important juncture in childhood and Mm. I never worked through it. And when I do, I know, I know from previous work that the benefits are going to be far more than just not reacting strongly in conversation. Mm -hmm. You remind me of the old vaudeville joke. The guy goes to the doctor. He says, doctor, it hurts when I go like that. The doctor says, so don't go like that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right so you have this injury it's there and you can avoid you just don't do that motion and the injury is there the pain is there but you won't feel it because you're gonna sort of avoid certain things that would trigger it and then you're put in a situation where you're forced to go like that you have to move and then it triggers the pain and now it's like oh hold on there's this there's a pain there right listen if we said it practically what's the difference if someone dismissed me in the normal course of the day, I never took that much risk in that relationship and I wasn't that bothered by it. It didn't, it never, it never exposed itself. So I never put myself in a situation with anyone else besides for my wife where dismissal can trigger a hurt reaction that would then make me aware <laughs> that, of the By the way, that itself, what you're <laughs> saying is, I mean, depending on how deep you want to go, you never put yourself in a situation where you would be exposed to the risk of being dismissed in such a deep way, which means to me what you're kind of implying that you're avoiding a lot of scenarios there. Probably. Yes, <laughs> probably. Yeah. I, <laughs> I probably am. Exactly. I probably am. Yeah. <laughs> so you want to listen to me, listen to the podcast. I don't want to risk being dismissed when I'm talking to someone. <laughs> <laughs> I don't talk. I have nothing to say. Uh-huh. <laughs> I won't even know if you click off. The will <laughs> no, know, but we read the analytics. <laughs> read the analytics. I don't know it's you. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. Right. But those are, I mean, those are examples, right? Those are examples. We're so, recreating a relationship yeah. that has an intensity 
And there's that motivation, the pull, the sexual drive, and everything else that has an intensity that could um, let us know about many of the breadcrumbs that exist. But, but, but uh, I'm just going to give pushback here because you're, you're telling me that the example you used with your wife, you're saying there's an issue, it was there, it was there for a long time. Um, you sort of learned how to compensate for it or to avoid it or to work around it. And the nature of the closeness of a marital relationship forced you to, to face it, basically. Correct. Okay. But you're still not telling me that there's anything, and I'm not pushing you to give personal examples in order to prove right. the point or argue the point, but right. I'm, I'm just going to say it. It's like, okay. So you're telling me it's the nature of the closeness of the relationship, which sort of makes it impossible to avoid or to retreat or to, you know, to, to go, uh, to go into hiding and to, to bail out instead of facing the issue. But nothing, what you're telling me make it implies that there's something inherent about the intimacy of the relationship. Meaning to there say <laughs> the premise that you're setting forth or maybe I said it for that. I don't know who started this, but that there are two areas of life that are going to force us to confront ourselves. So, so let me say it this way. Yeah. Right. I answer the question this way. Why didn't this come up a year ago? And the answer is because I wasn't as close to my wife a year ago. Oh, wow. And that's not the nature of that's, that's not a stain on her or on me. That's the purpose of the relationship is there's a, this continuous working of getting closer. And in that process, I would say that over the last year or maybe even over the last several months, our relationship between the, the push and the pull on both sides that, you know, if I'm disengaging in some way, she's going to say, hey, you know, we're married to each other. If she's disengaging in some way, I am, hey, we're married to each other, that over the last few months, maybe even shorter, over the last few weeks maybe, there was a closeness that um, was created in our relationship that wasn't there previously. And in this new closeness, a wound that I had previously emerged, which I never allowed myself over the course of the last, let's say it's a, a wound from five years old. So over the course of the last 32 years, I've never allowed myself to be as close to a human being as I was when I was five years old, like that innocence, that vulnerability that a five-year-old has as I have now five years into my marriage. And that couldn't take place in a platonic relationship? It hasn't. I have many. <laughs> uh -huh. I, I, I have many such. Uh -huh. May we use some money examples also. You know, you're the one who likes to talk about money. I'm a Damn. Guy, the rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> it's a stereotype about rabbis. Do you know my joke? You know, huh. joke. <laughs> Say the reason why a rabbi has to come to business people for money, why it's set up in this way, is so the rabbi, so the business guy can remind the rabbi about belief in God. Because Very good. The, the business guy experiences it every day. Every Not day, a joke so. at all. That's very, right. that's, that's hundred percent correct. In the books, we may not know. Books, we may not know. No, that, uh, you, you know, there's a Hayyem, the, the, the Rebbe's book where there's a thought for every day says that the people in business, they see divine providence on a daily basis. Correct. Uh, the scholars who sit in, uh, they study the holy books all day. So they understand divine providence as a, as an idea. People working in business understand divine providence as a reality. So when, yeah, I've seen yeah. it. I can give, I give an example now. We had this uh, vendor who was providing us with a lot of product. And over the last few weeks, he said nothing for us. And uh, we're digging, like, what happened? This guy was a good source for a long time. And... We find out through speaking to the company, they say, you know, we'll tell you what, there's this company in, uh, you know, such and such country that's been buying all of our product. And we asked him the name. He says, is this the guy? He says, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's the guy. We met the contact, the customer who bought all this product two weeks ago. 
you understand? This vendor was selling us product for several years. Over the last few weeks, that pipeline stopped. When we look into it, it's because they found a customer who was buying up everything. We just said, give me everything you have. So they didn't have anything for us. And this guy who was buying up everything, he's more than happy to sell to us. We got to know him two weeks ago. Those things, it's like, how does that happen? I just got notified about this today while I was in between recordings. My mm -hmm. business partner uh, let me you, know. You this. still run so a company on the side? <laughs> in between recordings. I still, <laughs> I still run a company yeah. on the side. You want to know something? Let's actually say that's, you know, that's the good question. Nothing's an accident. So s since when I first got into recovery, you know, we come in um, like sincere in, uh, in a certain way, right? With a certain innocence, even though I was <laughs> um, like an innocence almost to our anger. And for the first time, I'm expressing these childhood angers about everything that's wrong with the world and everything that's wrong with everyone. And some of it was expressed with my work with Jewish Community Watch, as an example, right? This, that was shortly after getting into recovery. And like, how can we allow innocent children to be hurt, right? And there's a, um, a reaction to that. An indignance, moral outrage, yes, indignance. moral outrage. Right. And today is like, I, I, it's not, there isn't the same outrage that there was then, not that I think it's less of an issue, but there was a, a simplicity to an innocence to the outrage, which was appropriate in a certain way. Today, I have a perspective that community has both sides and there's the closeness within a community. And then there's the confusion that exists because of sexual abuse. This happens in families also. I like to say that every case in a community has the same complexities as an incest case. People want, people want to know, why is there such abuse within the Orthodox community? Why is there such abuse within the Catholic Church? The, the benefits that are there create the same problem. Mm. Any incest case in the world, there's no one who has the moral clarity on how to handle a situation um, when an uncle molests a niece. It's confusing for the family. It's incest. It's the, the predator's family, the abuser. You don't have the normal terms, that normal clarity. Right is right. Wrong is wrong. Right? right. The us and them. We're fighting. Yes. It's right. much harder to, 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 to draw those lines Yeah. within an incest case. And a community, every case is an incest case. Because the teacher is your friend's first cousin. And, you know, this one, the teacher also taught your other kids. And his son is someone who you gave bar mitzvah lessons to. Like the whole... Right. It's every every case is an incest case. So you have the positive and negative aspects of a community, of a family, right? The same thing. So this is a nice story. I'm saying. It's not a story. It's a nice explanation. But where is my moral outrage? Where is the indignance? Where is that innocence that I once had? I was like, this is not okay. And right, heads must roll. So In other words, let me just clarify. You you you're not. You haven't, your position hasn't evolved on how egregious child sexual abuse is, obviously. You're, you're, you find Correct. it just as appalling as you ever did. You're saying that you were, in addition to being appalled by the act, which itself is, is absolutely appalling, then there's the community's reaction, which you were appalled by, like, hey, guys, this is open and shut. This is black and white. Correct. Why can't you just take a clear stance? And now you're saying, okay. I appreciate that maybe there are complexities that would explain why people don't show the the clear stance that you would have wanted them to on such a on such an Correct. you know such an intense Correct. issue. Correct. Not that they shouldn't, meaning there's something to overcome. Right. There's, Not that they shouldn't right. eventually come to a place of clarity, but now it's like you can be sympathetic to the fact that there's some stuff to work through to get to that clarity. Right. And for me to stand here and say the community is a horrible place and the proof is that abuse happens and they're not clear, that sounds similar to me as saying families are a horrible thing <laughs> because abuse happens and families aren't clear on what to do. Right. Right. Okay. So that was a long-winded way of saying that I arrived in a similar place with money. And money is bad. And it's driving people crazy. And it drove me crazy. And maybe a life without money would be a better life for me. Okay. And 
there was a, a disdain that I had for money early recovery. Like, what am I chasing? What do I want from this? Like, I was so caught up. And at, in, but let, you were still running a company at the time. Yes, I owed vendors money. <laughs> right? I'm saying I had employees I had to pay. I didn't have the luxury uh -huh. of saying like, guys, I had a, uh, <laughs> I had an insight, right. and right, it's it's such a good one that you guys all get screwed. Right? So you are a self-hating <laughs> capitalist. A self-hating right, a self-hating capitalist to a degree. Uh, yeah. So there was this part of me that wanted out. Right? I'm like, okay, obviously in the right way, but let me see if I can sell my business. Let me see if I can get off this, this train. What do I need to be steeped in this conversation? People are chasing after money. I felt like you can easily get caught in the rat race. This guy's telling you how much money he's making here, and then you f I would feel insecure, and then I'd uh, jump on that train. Maybe I just need out. Get out of that craziness. I don't think. And f when was this? Last, how, how long ago was this? Let's say 2013 when I got into recovery. By 2014, 2015, I was ready to sell my business. Okay. Reb Chase, I tell you, every single time I tried, sometimes it got closer to the finish line, sometimes not. Oh, you tried? The, multiple times, and I was close. And the idea times. was not to start a new business. It was to cash out and go live on the beach somewhere and... Cash out, passive Meditate all day. No, not meditate all day, but these things that I'm passionate about, like this and others and many that I've done over mm -hmm. the years. But how are you going to be in, an, an activist without money? Did you work that out? I what? Yeah, I wasn't going to be an activist without money. I was going to have money. I was going to cash out. I'd invest it in a passive way. Uh -huh. So I'm not steeped in the, the uh -huh. business of it. I'd have some sort of return. Mm -hmm. okay, I wouldn't be able to do the same things, but I also wouldn't be, I, I would have more time to do it. Got it. So that was the vision. today I'm paying people to do some things. That was what I thought okay. I wanted to do. And for whatever reason, every single time I got pulled back in. And sometimes... I feel that way about process. fundraising. Right. <laughs> no joke. Right, no joke. Just get out of it. What do I need to be in it for? Okay, yeah, but so you tried. You, 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 you tried in earnest to sell the company. And I got close, and a couple of times the process was very, very painful. Like I was trying to force it in such a strong way that I paid a heavy price for, for trying. I was so determined that now I've got the message that it's not, I'm meant to be in it. Okay, I also have these passions and I also have expressions. So I figure out how to, uh, how to balance it in some way. Today is twice a month. It may seem like there's tons of content being produced and there is, but for the most part, it's twice a month that I dedicate specifically to this and the rest is a team is able to uh to to handle it's a significant commitment of time money mm -hmm. energy and focus but yes i'm still very much uh in the business and required to be in the business and it's so very much a part of my life there are people who run companies and every other week they get on the private jet and they fly to paris to go eat at a fancy restaurant and they spend a day doing that and you sit in a podcast studio once or twice a month. Right. Or another way of saying it is there was a time in my life where I ran a company and on the side I had a little addiction to keep my, <laughs> me busy with. <laughs> and today I use those same um, skills, mm -hmm. <laughs> balance and resources to, to hear. Mm -hmm. How do I have... My, my point is, which is the, really the conversation we're having, and you said it about fundraising as well, is there something that's been clear to me? It's like, I cannot get out of this. Mm. I cannot. I am not meant to. Maybe one day I will. Maybe the, the lessons that I've needed to learn from this sandbox of active involvement day to day with money, I will have learned those lessons. But it doesn't seem to me to be the case now or any time. <laughs> It's so it's so confusing because it's like as soon as you hit a place like where you're spiritually you have you're, you're clear you have spiritual clarity and like you know you finally you got the ego under control and you, you have your your focus and here are the things that are really important and it's not about the material stuff it's all about it's all about spiritual things and values and uh, the you know the deep ideas and 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 meaning and 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 it's like okay great i got it so then let me spurn the trappings of this physical world this false world and and it's like it's so confusing 
because it's like they won't let you. <laughs> they. They. The cabal. They. The, cabal <laughs> the system, man. The Talk system, about the yeah. system. The system. They won't right, let you. That, it's, it's like when you finally figure out what life's really about. Okay, so you should graduate. You should get to leave this world. You know, yeah. So uh, you know, want to know what helped me with this? Like one of the, the things that helped me with, like, okay, I must accept. I I can accept the secret thing because it sounds so moral, right? I'm gonna sit and learn all day. I'm not gonna have to fundraise. I'll just be able to teach classes. That's I what I want to do. Analytics, right? That's and for me the same way. I'll do these kind of things. I'll do other stuff. Some causes are more public. Some some less, right? Not everything I do is with a camera on my face, but those things that I'm. I'll be able to focus fully on this. It sounds so good and moral and right. Sounds it? right. It sounds so right. So um, one, of my, one of my sponsors that I had, I had a few over the years, told me at one point, Ellie, no dating. No dating. Completely off the table. And like, my addiction wasn't really that. My addiction was much more, you know, like I called it transactional relationships. Not a true, not a true dating. And to hear... To be told at the age of 27, 28, 29 from my sponsor, when my mother is <laughs> on my case about finding a shidduch, that no dating for how long? I'll tell you when. For the right, indefinitely. Future. Indefinitely. No dating, no relationships. And it was difficult. It was, there was something difficult about it. There was something that, um, even with, within relationships, that I kept it alive in some way. To, to feel a certain something. Even if I wasn't communicating and involved in the relationship, there was this feeling that I used to get that there's some woman somewhere which loves me that's not my mother, some woman somewhere which loves me um, or would be with me. And even if I'm not accessing it, that like, was a, a need of mine in some way. I felt was a need. And during this, he told me, cut off everything. Like zero, zero contacts, zero dates. You're unavailable. So I went through this process of getting comfortable being alone. I used to sometimes you know, go to dates with myself. It was just, you know, I'm completely off. No communication, no nothing. He said zero, no relationships with, with, uh, with females. Nothing that can even smack of it. It was, more str it was stricter than when I was in yeshiva, <laughs> what he put me through. And then at some point in time, Chase, I got comfortable with it. And I said, hey, this is okay. I'm okay being alone. And I told him, and I said, you know something? I'm starting to enjoy this. He said, you want to know something, Ellie? You're ready for a relationship. <laughs> <laughs> right. So what, what landed the plane for me and made me feel comfortable? It was actually a sikha that I learned. And tell me if I, uh, it's a, a true story. So there's, it says there were two of the forefathers that received different names. There was Avram, which became Avraham. And when he took on the name Avraham, he no longer was allowed to be called. Would, I think they say it's, it's forbidden to call him by his old name. Yeah. Abraham became Abraham, and that's all. He is forever Abraham. Yep. And then you had Jacob. Yaakov became Yisrael. Jacob became Israel. But then how do we refer to him today? Abraham, yeah. Isaac, Jacob. So there's a sikha from the rabbi, and I don't know where. There's a teaching with the rabbi where he explains why. And I don't remember exactly the Avraham portion, the Abraham portion, but I do remember the Yaakov Yisrael, the Jacob in Israel. So he said, Jacob represents struggle, the day-to-day -day struggle of life. Israel represents superseding, surpassing. I don't have this attachment to the struggle anymore. Very similar to what I described with the struggle of dating and all of that. And then being in a space where I'm not struggling with that. I, don't, I didn't feel that need. I was okay. I was like, hey, you know, I can see this. I can live the single life, I told him. I can see how this can, be, uh, mm -hmm. this can be done. And what happens? And we say, okay, great. You've stepped. You've, you've went through this struggle. You wrestled with the angel. And you got to the point that you're comfortable in the status of Israel. That was, gr that was great. Now go back and be Jacob without the attachment to the struggle. And he also compared it to six days of the week and Shabbos. Like, yes, Shabbos is great that we can access it, but then comes along Sunday and we're right back in the uh, work week. And when I learned, learned that, I took it as a personal message for me. It's great that I don't feel the same attachment that I once did 
to the business in the form of the identity in the form of everything else but go back in the struggle i'm still very much in it mhm i went rabbinical on you no this is great i'm 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 like you said earlier uh, you you didn't say uh, it was a bill w quote but you said we we, we didn't get, uh, you paraphrased it slightly differently but you said we didn't get sober in order to go to meetings right right so which is a bill w quote um but what you're saying is that it's like and don't get me wrong here, and nobody listening should get me wrong. You're not saying one of these things like relapse is part of recovery and go back out there. You're not saying that. What you're saying is that if you have to avoid all of your triggers in order to stay sober, maybe you're not so sober. Or maybe say like this, there's a phase in recovery where avoiding your triggers may be part of it because your, your, your sobriety is not that strong. But ultimately, the goal is that you should be able to be who you are and remain true to that, even when you're in the, the very places that would have preyed upon your, your, your weaknesses in the past. Relationships and money. Yeah. And if I'd have to say that, just scanning quickly, those are probably... The two ways that people relapse? No, the two, places, the two ways that people get into meetings in the first place. Oh. There's a major financial issue. I would, there's a third. There's health issues as well. Uh -huh. But oftentimes a major financial issue or something major in, the, in, in sexual relations. Most people who attended the meetings that I went to came in one of two ways. Usually it was because their wife caught them cheating. And in other cases, they came through a different program. So I don't know the story of how they, um, they came in. The, Their original uh, bottom. Yeah, I'm thinking also of someone I spoke to um, recently who he's struggling with drug addiction, and he was in rehab a few years ago. And I asked him, you know, what got you to rehab last time? What brought you to your knees and got you comfortable to go in there? And he said, uh, well, I lost my job and had to move back in with my parents. It was extremely humiliating. and. I said, oh, I got to get my life together. I said, you know what's going to happen, right? If you, don't get, if you don't get this together, you know what's going to happen. You're going to lose, your, you're gonna lose this, the job you have now, right? Meaning, those, those, meaning if, if that's what it's going to take to wake you up, that's what's going to happen, right, by the laws of gravity. My point is, is that oftentimes just thinking, you know, I haven't done a full uh, a survey, but I would have to imagine that Putting health concerns aside, two of the main reasons people will come in will be related to recovery, which come in is what? Meaning they, they come into a certain level of light, a certain level of awareness. I have a problem that now needs addressing. Will come through relationships or through financial issues. Is that fear? Is that, is that a... Uh... Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know the numbers. I've never, you know, seen any, any studies, but... Just anecdotally, I would say I don't even think health concerns, uh, um, surprisingly enough, I don't think health concerns are a big driver to people uh, hitting bottom. I think people have an, an incredible capacity to rationalize those kinds of problems. Um, I think that's why addicts OD, because, you know, they right. get brought back from the, from the brink of death, and you would think that would be hitting bottom, but it's not. But... You know, you hear the stories that people say in their first 24 hours. Um, rarely are those stories stories of, well, you know, I almost died. In fact, to the contrary, you'll hear, he'll hear them say, I almost died 20 times and I just kept going back out. Right. That's true. That's a good point. When I was saying health concerns, I was thinking of a couple people I know who had car accidents and the, uh, like being immobilized for a couple of, uh, like a period of time. Brought them to a certain. I wonder if it's that they couldn't move or they course. couldn't work, and the bills were piling up. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, <laughs> right? Maybe. So, but so you would agree with me that totally. It's, it's yeah, it's proven out that a lot of M more that more than your physical safety. Right. In my case, in my case, it was a relationship. That's within a relationship. Um, I tried 
stopping behaviors that I was engaging in since I was 13, from the ages of 13 to 27 or 28, it never occurred to me that, it occurred to me, but it never got me to complete um, demoralization. I'm done. Like, tell me what to do, and mm -hmm. I will do. Ask for help. Right. I read a book. I, people, but I'm humility, the brokenness that uh, we spoke about earlier. Just give me the prescription, and I will take it. That happened after I got into a relationship, and I saw myself behaving in ways that were unrecognizable. Yeah, there was just, there was a demoralization to it, and it was very quick. It was very quick. The proof is in the pudding. Within. One year of meeting someone who ended up being my wife, you know, five years later, but within one year of meeting her, I was in meetings. And this problem was something that was going on from uh, teenage years. By the way, the flip side of that is, and I think this might help people to understand uh, one aspect of addiction um, is... Now people maybe will understand why so many addicts isolate. When, when you don't have intimate relationships, you can continue the addiction much more easily. Oh, exactly. Right. And when you're in an intimate relationship, it's going to constantly clash with the addiction. Some people might even argue the addiction itself is an intimate relationship or a substitute. There is a quality to it. Yeah, for, there's definitely a quality to it. That, that yeah. That and, and, and therefore, it's like being in an intimate relationship is an inherent contradiction with the addiction. One, sooner or later, one of them is going to give. Now, usually, it's the intimate relationship, which gets uh gets thrown aside but eventually uh in when... place of the, that's what happened by me i did but during the course i did i broke up i said i can't i can't i can't do this anymore and had all the reasons why she wasn't the right person for me mm -hmm. but during that process i returned to therapy and i started looking at some of my um the underlying issues it woke something up inside me that this time i couldn't bury in the same way and um, when my therapist recommended that I speak to a, uh, someone, a, a patient of his who was also attending meetings, within two or three weeks, I attended my first meeting. So we kind of understand why intimate relationships force us to have to choose to grow. Why, why does money have that same effect? As a CEO, I was once told, a CEO doesn't have the luxury of a personality. Hmm. So there was, who'd I hear it from? From a, someone who came hmm. in to administer personality profiles to the team so that I can put people in the right position. And he would measure what's their personality. Right. But you were how exempt. How they understanding their job. Right. So we would measure everyone from what's your personality? What's your job? They would take a test. And then he'd say, hey, this workload is putting stress on this guy. So even though he's doing it, you may want to evaluate his work schedule. You took a guy who's very detail-oriented and very task-focused, and you put him in projects and you're forcing him to think much more big picture every single day, right? So a certain personality profile. And I said, what about mine? And he said, this <laughs> CEO doesn't have the luxury of a personality profile, right? You want to own a company? Uh, you, have to, uh, you, have to, you have to contort yourself however it must, be, however it must happen. So certainly from that perspective, there's definitely another level of it. And I think you're seeing it in your own business. You don't have, you're, you're not a rabbi who's paid a salary to speak. You're reading analytics, <laughs> for goodness sakes. You're doing fundraising and things that drive you absolutely bananas. It's like, how did I learn all this stuff in order to call people about money? It's the last thing I wanted to do. But then you're faced with the reality that in order to get your message out, it requires some of these, some of this, yeah. Um, energy in the form of money in order to disseminate uh, the wisdom. It's not enough just to have the knowledge. So you're saying that in a good way that you can't afford the luxury of a personality, meaning you can't afford the luxury of being limited to a personality type. Exactly. You I mean, have to transcend. We have to work our stuff out. The personality type, it's like, 
there's a little bit of ego in that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You got to be bigger than that. The breadcrumbs, the breadcrumbs, the breadcrumbs. Yeah. 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 Okay. Not that we shouldn't try, right? Of course. Focus on the things that are as easy as possible. It's much easier for you to teach than it is to fundraise. But you've had to fundraise every year. Right. And, and year to year, because of whatever thing inside you wants to keep growing, you said what was easier, what, was, what I figured out how to do last year is not going to be enough for my plans for this year. Right. So now I got to figure out how to do more of what drove me crazy figuring out last year. Last year you figured it out. There was a time where we were speaking where some of these, where we started speaking, where some of these things you're doing today, a public campaign, was not in your wheelhouse. Like, right. Okay, now I'll do a public campaign. But now you want to do one that's two times the size right. of the one you did last year. It changes the game. And now there's a level of discomfort. You don't have the luxury of a, of a personality either. Yeah, We're and I would say out. that the content has grown. It, you know, im ein kemach ein teure. Im ein teure ein kemach. Kemach means flour. You know, it means food. Means money. money, yeah. If there's no if there's no Torah, there's no money. There's no money, there's no Torah. Meaning to say that the, the spiritual and the material keep feeding off of each other. And the material forces you to grow spiritually, but then the spiritual growth requires greater material uh, <laughs> resources to to further the reach. We've completed what we need to complete. Okay, great. So we'll do it again sometime. Well, not this conversation. This conversation, we've spoken about sex and money enough. Yeah. You know what's great? Hmm. We mixed a couple of sikhas into it somehow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Un unintentionally. Unintentionally. I apologize <laughs> for anyone who came, <laughs> who came thinking we were... Uh, yeah, there's no hidden agenda. About money and intimacy. Right. Yeah. Jason, <laughs> always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Ellie. Okay.